What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the Annie Tunes and Podcast. Today's guest is a special one. It is Brian Ellis, founder of the Adventure Challenge, a now over $100 million scratch off adventure book or dating book. They were recently featured on the Ellen Show. Brian shares his whole journey with the business, what he's up to now, and being financially free at 28 years old and is now doing a surfing whole documentary series because he's able to do that now. And I think it's awesome, kind of what he's sharing and where he came from and the just the whole adventure with the business. It's so cool to see. So I hope you guys love this episode. How's it going? <laughs> doing good. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Where are you located right now? I'm in uh, Redding, California. Oh, nice. I like all the plants. Thank you. Love the plant action. No, I never thought <laughs> I was a plant person until I got one plant. And then I just became like a plant whore. And now I have plants all over my house. Like, every- Are they real? They're all real? Yeah, they're all real. Yeah. Oh, wow. God, that's yeah. impressive. I can't keep one alive. <laughs> well, I wish I could take credit. I have a plant guy. There you go. <laughs> in waters. He's like from Jamaica. He's super cool. But like every week he comes and waters the plants and takes care of them for me. So yeah, he's a rat guy. Much needed. Plants and fish. Can't do that yet. But I, that's my goal before I get a pet or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, you should get a jellyfish. Those are pretty rad. Those are cool. But we have them everywhere in Florida, just laying around. No. everywhere i actually want to get seahorses oh those would be cute yeah i think that would be awesome a whole That'd tank of them would be so cool so but they're they're very hard to maintain from what i've heard have you ever been stung by jellyfish yes really D- yes it's the worst really yes they say <sighs> someone has to pee on you but i couldn't let that happen so <laughs> yeah, i just put some me. ointment on it or whatever they gave me but it was a while ago, but yes, they're everywhere here. So if you go in the water and you just go swimming for the day, you're going to find a ton just swimming around you. So it's kind of scary. The only time I've ever been stung was in Florida and I was seven. And yeah. I just, I mean, at seven, it's every, any pain is a level 10 pain. And for so sure. I won't get in the water in Florida. Like whenever I go to Florida, I just won't, it just freaks me out too much. <laughs> well, you guys have stingrays, right? You, do, you shuffle your feet and I don't spend much time swimming in the water. I usually am surfing. So I paddle out. And they they don't bother you while they're swimming. It's just if you step on one, then they sting you. And yeah, so- I was actually there like two weeks ago when I went surfing um, in San Diego. And they're oh, like, no. you just have to shuffle your feet. You'll be fine. And I'm like, I don't even know. There were so many rocks. I couldn't even do that. And then when yeah. you're jumping on and off the board, I'm like, what if I land on one? I was terrified. So- oh, same. <laughs> yeah. Never let my feet hit the floor. Even when jumping off a wave, you just keep your feet above the, the ocean floor. Otherwise, yeah, you could get stung. or oh, I'll try that next time. I'm definitely going to come back soon and surf. So, all right. So you have a business called the Adventure Challenge, which is so cool to me. So the first thing I kind of want to ask you is how you got started with that. Because I know you weren't in that space before you got into this. It's been like three or four years, right? Since you started the company. Yep. Started the company April uh, 2nd, 2018 is when I started making prototypes for the company. Mm. Bought the LLC September 25th of 2018. Dang, it hasn't been that long. That's so cool. So how'd you get, how'd you get started in it with the idea and just everything? The idea came out of nowhere. Honestly, I wasn't thinking about ideas. I wasn't trying to think of a company to start. I was thinking of ideas on how to make some passive income because I've always been an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And my idea was I'm going to build a real estate photography company here in Reading because there wasn't a lot of competition and the competition was pretty weak. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I could do better. So that was kind of what I was going to do because I had just gotten fired from a job that I really liked. And I was like, I'm going to do that. But something in my gut, when I got the idea for this book, I was like, man, I wish it just existed so I could have it and I could use it with my friends because I have ADHD. I don't like sitting down playing Settlers, Catan or, you know, all those other board games that just go crazy. Yeah. Man, if there was a game where every time you played it, you did something different, but also you didn't know what you were going to do until you played it. Like kind of like Jumanji, you know, the old school. Yeah. I'm like, dude, that would be rad. And so that's when I got the idea. And I was like, you know what? I bet if I make the book, I could take it with me when I do any public speaking or things like that. And I could just sell it at a little booth. I was not thinking e-commerce was not thinking (laughs) anything big scale. And so that's, that's what made me start it is I was like, I just want to make a book that I have that I can sell when I do public speaking and that I can, you know, sell to my friends and family and they can play it too. And then I can get out of game night because we can do something more fun. And then as I started to create the idea, I started to get a lot more vision for it, a lot more idea for it turning into a company. Something in my gut was like, this is going to be a multi-million dollar company. I told a few friends that I thought I was crazy. Fair, fair enough. You know, I'm like this book turning into a multi-million dollar company. And um, 
Yeah. So I literally spent six, seven, eight months making prototypes and I had no idea how to make prototypes. So it was just a lot of stumbling in the dark until I figured out how to do it. And then once the prototypes were made, then more doors started opening up for investment and, and things like that. So when you say prototypes, is this you kind of coming up with a creative concept behind it and maybe like drawing out ideas? What was kind of like the original process behind the prototype? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so the product didn't exist yet, you know, so nobody, I, I was hoping there would be maybe something close to it. There was nothing out there. The only books that had any kind of scratch off material in it were like, it's like this children's hangman book where you play hangman by yourself. Like you pick a letter, scratch it off. It says yes or no. And then, you, you know, so that was the only thing that existed. So I was like, okay, so I have to start from like scratch, no pun intended. <laughs> and yeah. literally, yeah, had to buy lottery tickets, scratch material, and had to like cut it into little squares, place it over, you know, the little copy of adventure. And then I was like, well, how do you put a Polaroid picture in here? You know? And then, so I bought this double-sided photo tape, placed it there next to it. And so, yeah, I mean, it was, a, I mean, I have them hanging on my wall over there, the, the, the original prototypes, they're just really shitty looking prototypes, just, <laughs> you know, super janky. But what that allowed was for me to show my vision to somebody else. You know, and a lot of times entrepreneurs get stuck on like, well, I don't know the next step to take. It's like, well, you always have a step you can be taking. You just don't think that that step's going to have a big impact. But it, it did. Even just creating a really shitty looking prototype, I was able to show it to a friend. The friend helped me make a less shittier prototype. I was able to take that less shitty prototype and show it to another friend who helped me make even a better prototype. And then that happened three or four times before I was able to send it to a manufacturer and said, this is my vision make it professionally. And then they sent me a professional version of the idea that I had created several prototypes of. So you have concepts behind like relationships, like different dates, different family nights with friends, um, a cooking one, I think I saw as well, mm -hmm. which is, that's really cool to me. Um, so when you come up with these ideas and I'm sure, you know, now you have a team of people behind you, but at the beginning, did you kind of like look at something and you're like, Oh, that'd be fun to do. Like, how did you come up with some of these ideas? And like, what are some just for people that aren't aware of what it is exactly? Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that was, I think the secret sauce. And I think that's why we're able to stay ahead of all the copycats that are coming out right now. There's like a ton of people making scratch off date books now. Okay. And, um, which is a really weird feeling to see, you know, like, yeah, like it, I was the original, <laughs> Yeah, it, you're, you know, it's almost offensive because you're thinking that's my baby. You're, you're like, well, any good idea is going to be copied, you know? And for me, I want to stay original my whole life. I don't want to copy other people's stuff. So they can copy and make some money, but like, you know, my company is always going to be the Coca-Cola of beverages. I, I feel so, um, of the scratch off industry anyways. And so, but basically the ideas, yeah, they came from literally just diving into your imagination and contemplating what could I do with object a, and how could we have fun with a ball of yarn? Like, it sounds really stupid, but I would literally hold random objects and say, what could we do with this? That could be fun. And so for like the ball of yarn, for instance, I, we have a kid's book coming out. And one of the games is like, I was holding this ball of yarn. I was like, what game could we make with this? I was like, I bet if we strung this ball of yarn all over this living room, it could make a really fun laser maze obstacle course that you have to crawl through. I was like, Ooh, that would be fun to go crazy over that. And then, you know, you grab, you know, a spray bottle, a bottle of water, you buy a stapler and you just hold these objects and think what kind of fun things could we do with this? And then you create a game or an adventure around it. So, um, and then there's also the aspect of for like our couple's book, one of the adventures is you're both making a pie, an apple pie, but one of you is blindfolded and the person who's not blindfolded is guiding you with their hands and they can't talk. So you're literally just walking around blind, you know, without sight and your partner is guiding you to grab the eggs, crack the eggs, stir it, put the applesauce in. And it's like, okay, well, you're doing an activity that's not that original. You're making an apple pie. You know, if a book said, go make an apple pie together, it'd be like, wow, real original. But you're, you're taking away one of your senses and you're adding an element of physical touch and like flirtatious, you know, flirtatious energy where you're having to touch and move and you're learning to communicate with your partner in a way that you're not familiar with. So it brings a level of connection. And so honestly, it's going to sound really funny, but I got that idea while I was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> like, I was on my phone, just typing out ideas. And I was like, 
that's a good idea. And the funny thing is, is that idea is the most viral video we've made, probably like 100, 120 million views. Jeez. And it's like, I literally people like, how'd you come up with that idea? And I was like, yeah, you know, sitting on the toilet, you know, <laughs> coming up with the idea. And, and, but literally it's just like, you're taking, some of the ideas come from just taking everyday things that you would normally do and adding an original spin to it, adding, you know, and that's the aspect of, incorporating novelty into your everyday life, which I think brings a lot of joy and fulfillment in people's lives. We get stuck in these routines and these patterns and these, and these rituals. And it's like, how can you shake up your day even just 1% every day, whether it's driving a different route home from work or it's trying a restaurant you've never had before, or, you know, trying to figure out a way to open up conversation with your partner that you've never, you know, thought about. And so that's kind of the, the ideas behind the book are all ways to kind of nudge you in that direction of, you know, opening up lines of communication, ways of thinking that are original. Yeah. It's interesting to me. And the reason why I love it so much is because growing up for me, I never thought anything was fun. I was like, what is fun? I always was doing like the same stuff. And I'm like, none of this is fun to me. Like, was, is there something wrong with me that I can't have fun? And then when I got older, I realized that the most fun things are when you're doing something different that you've never done before. And it's always like new experiences, a new twist on it stuff mm -hmm. like that to make things different. And that is what's actually fun. So that's why I love this whole concept so much is because like so many people are doing the exact same thing. They don't know how to do it any differently. They're not creative. And they're like, how do I make life more interesting? And it becomes, you know, that's people get depressed all the time. They're doing the same stuff and there's no, you know, new twists on things. So I love that so much. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs from what, you know, my experience in talking to people is a lot of people have to spend a lot of time alone in order to think of different ideas or just kind of like focus. It seems like for you that you probably had to like do new fun things and figure out like, okay, how can I make this interesting? Like, so growing up for you, do you think that it was something to where like you had to spend more time alone when you, you know, before this whole thing started or were you always doing stuff with friends? Yeah, no, I, I'm not good with alone time. I'm okay. learning now how to be alone because, you know, one, one way we, uh, we cover up our pain or things we're going through is by being around other people. Mm -hmm. so we don't think, you know, being alone can be, can be scary. Um, and I grew up in a big family. So I grew up around, you know, people all the time, friends all the time, and then, you know, going to school all the time. And so, um, yeah, I, but I think some of the best ideas come when you're bored, which is interesting. And we don't allow ourselves to be bored enough. We always have something to keep us entertained, something yeah. to distract us. And for me, putting down my phone for two days, trapping myself in my home alone with nothing to do. I end up pacing in circles, talking to myself, going a little bit crazy. And then ideas just start to pump out. And that's originally how I got the idea for the adventure challenge was I was really bored. I was just walking around my house doing nothing and the idea just popped in. And so, yeah, I think alone time is really important um, for some people to come up with ideas and to problem solve. And then, you know, some people come up with ideas more when they're around people. But for me, yeah, um, alone time is kind of a crucial part of the creative um, process, I think. So when you come up with a fun idea or fun game or whatever that, that is, do you run it by different people to be like, hey, would this be fun? Like how much do you have to tweak each idea for it to be put in the actual book? I mean, now, if an adventure goes into one of the books that people buy now, mm -hmm. that adventure was tested probably five or 10 different times. And each time there was feedback that was brought to us, we made tweaks to it. We had focus groups. We had moms with their kids, dads with their daughters, friends with their you know, lovers with their lovers, like we've tested it all over the place. And so, yeah. But when I first made the book, hell no, I would just write an idea, slap it down and go, go do it. It sounds yeah. like, <laughs> and then like this one sucks. And then, you know, I think the first thousand books I sold. Yeah. None of the, like, I think half of the ideas from the date book was tested because I actually took different people on dates like that. I've always been like a creative dater, you know, like what yeah. this, this date apart from a date they've ever been on. And so one of like a date I really thought was cool was getting like an air mattress, blowing it up and putting like a nice picnic on it with like a nice blanket. And so I remember I took a girl on a date on the water. It was the middle of winter. So it wasn't like you could swim and it was this massive king size air mattress. And it just like blew her mind. It was like, she loved the date. We had a ton of chemistry, lots of awesome conversation. And um, now that's a viral date. Like that's a date that you see all over TikTok and Instagram and it was like, oh yeah, like I did that like years ago with the girl and she loved it. And it went into one of the books and now it's, you know, 
Um, but the other half of the dates were just concepts that I came up with and thought they'd be cool. And some of them worked and some of them didn't, but now I'm really proud because like, uh, um, I don't actually even come up with any ideas for the books anymore. Um, I'm not involved with that process. Okay. We have, I think we have a team of 15 employees who work with the products and then they get focus groups of like a hundred or more people to do mm. these dates or these adventures. And so it's a really elaborate process they're going through. They take a lot of pride in the excellence with each adventure that comes out, especially we released a sex book, the adventure challenge in bed. Oh then, yeah. We, we hired a uh, sex psychologists, sex counselors, relationship counselors. We hired a large team of experts to where we can minimize the triggers and trauma and anything that could come with the book. Cause sex is a very vulnerable activity and we don't want to just go telling people to go do this crazy thing that could have, you know, consequences relationally or actually form disconnection. And so we were very careful with the people that we brought onto the team to help us navigate through that. So that took us probably 18 months to make because of how intense we were about making sure that each challenge was bringing more connected sex. And it wasn't just like, go try this, you know? So how many adventures are in each book? Um, well, it depends. Each book is different. Well, that one, for example, I guess we'll talk about that one. How many adventures are in that one? That's 30, I think 30, 35. Yeah, I think 35. Okay. So what's an example? Cause in my mind, I'm like trying to picture this right now. What is an example of one of them? Totally. Yeah. One of them that's fun. This is a more cheeky, just fun one. That's not super crazy, but um, it's called the Mr. And Mrs. Smith, Mr. And Mrs. Smith. Yeah. I think that's the right name for it. Um, and essentially you have a nice, you have a dinner together, like a, a small dinner that you guys make, but then it starts off with Nerf guns. And then you have a Nerf gun fight <laughs> in your house. Whenever you get hit with one of the Nerf darts, wherever it hits, you have to take that piece of clothes off. Ah. Um, and that's part one. I'm not going to go into part two or part three. Okay. Uh, but basically- it, <laughs> I can it, kind of see where it's going. We're progressing to, yeah. But it's, it's, what that's doing is it's, it's introducing fun into sex again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The, the, and I, I don't know what rating your podcast is. So I'm going to be very careful with my language. It's all good. But, but it's like the, the, the goal of sex should not be just to orgasm. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. connection, it's play, it's intimacy. And so a lot of the challenges have that fun element of like, like you're running around a house, shooting each other with Nerf guns. Like you're tapping into that inner kid, you know what I'm saying? Like, and you're, you're having fun with your partner again. So that's, that's one example uh, of one of the, the sex challenges. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like everyone, cause it's funny when I talk to people that are even like 65 years old and in our minds, we're like, that's so much older, but they are literally still children. Like they do the, it's, it's crazy. And everyone I think craves that, um, mm -hmm. that like, you know, connecting to the inner child, because that's what everyone kind of goes back to is like, you know, how you were when you were a kid, what, what you did when you were a kid, like people always think about it. We all do. And I yeah. think, yeah, doing challenges like that or adventures like that, will relate to every single person, no matter what their age is. So I think that's really, you know, a smart way to go about it. How many adventures have you done in total? I mean, hundreds. I mean, like when I first came out with the book, I was doing all of the challenges myself to get video footage of it, to make promo videos. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't have a number I could give you. I've done hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of adventures. Yeah. Uh, so many of them to the point to where you do 20 adventures a day. It's not as fun anymore. <laughs> you know, so it becomes crazy. So, um, but yeah, I would do, we did a lot of adventures. Yeah. So are any of these adventures involving traveling or are they all things you can do kind of wherever you are? Anywhere you are, it's universal. So, I mean, now we are, we just started selling in Germany and, um, Mexico, um, Canada, Australia, Brazil, like we're, we're by the end of this year, we should be in most countries. Um, we have to tweak adventures for each different country because mm -hmm. it's different to tell somebody in, um, Germany to go like in America, you can say, Hey, go hot tub hopping where you kind of go yeah. to different hot tubs and oh, that's whatever. A cool idea. Yeah. It's fun. Um, in Germany, you know, I don't know the laws, but you know, you could get arrested and that could be a huge fine. You know, as in America, most places it doesn't really matter. You know what I'm saying? You can go to a hot tub and the security just goes leave. Um, and so we have to tweak our adventures depending. Oh, India is another big one. We're about to start something in India. It's like, we don't know like who, like how popular are hot tubs in this country? How popular is this activity in this country? So depending on the country, we have to change the adventures quite a bit, but as far as within the States, we don't. And then as far as travel, no, each adventure tells you how long it's going to take, 
what time of day to do it and things like that. We are making one for travel though. That is specific for traveling, but none of the adventures tell you to like buy a plane ticket and go to Canada or anything like that. Okay. So it is more of a process than I thought, because you probably have to change the language inside the book as well. Right. Do you have to translate it to fit each country? So it's a, okay. So that's a big process. You're creating basically a whole separate book for each country, right? From what it seems like. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like we thought going internationally would be easy. And, but like, that's the things we have to do to stay ahead of our competition is like, you know, they aren't thinking these things through. And we had to, I mean, it's a multi-million dollar process to yeah. go worldwide. And so uh, like creating it in America was simple compared to the aspect of, you know, hiring different people in Germany or China or India to help translate the book and cross-reference ideas and, you know, find places to ship and sell without it being $30 of shipping. So huh. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a pretty elaborate, we, we our staff is like, I think we have 115 employees now. Dang. So it's grown quite big from, you know, just me in my bedroom or sitting on the toilet coming with adventures. To, and to the- fast. I mean, you've made like what, like almost a hundred million dollars in sales. Is that right? We've made over a hundred million, but we Damn. almost, so we, we hit 77 million in sales last year. So we try. we almost, we, we thought we were going to hit that hundred mil last year, but we got close, but this year we'll go over a hundred million. Yeah. That's insane. Did COVID really help that? I'm sure it did. It did. Yeah. I mean, at first it dipped for like two days when everyone was mm-hmm. panicking and thought, you two know, oh, go to shit. <laughs> yeah. but no, yeah, for two days it dipped and then it doubled. And that was crazy right. for us because it was like, we had 15 employees then. And then we had to double to 30 because sales went from, you know, $30,000 a day to $60,000 a day instantly. Cause everyone's stuck at home and needs things to do. And so we're training people over zoom and Skype and I'm like, you know, wearing a hazmat suit, going to people's houses. Cause I was back. <laughs> when I thought it was like crazy. And then I know. it was like, I, you know, you're going to places trying to like train people and then decontaminate before you go back to your own home. And that was a crazy, but yeah, COVID definitely helped give us a, an extra kick. Yeah. I mean, that's a shitload as far as overall mm-hmm. growth goes. And as far as like building that. So I know you said like the videos were a huge thing, like the marketing, would mm-hmm. you say that's kind of what helped it grow so much or like what? Cause it's, it's really tricky when you think about it from an entrepreneurial standpoint is like getting the message out there to, you know, even a million is, is tough, but to push past that, to really keep growing, like what was the biggest thing for you? Was it mostly the marketing? Yeah. I mean, it was hundred percent the marketing and we didn't have videos go like viral at first. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are trying to make a video to go viral and that didn't work for us. Going viral for us is figuring out, you know, a good ROAS on ass spend. It's like, mm-hmm. how, how much do we need to pay for each customer and how can we get that cost to be profitable? So anyone can sell, I would say, uh, most people could sell a million dollars with a product, but are you making any profit off that? You know, if you're selling dollars, if you're selling dimes, but charging a dollar, <laughs> you're not making any money, you know? And so uh, that's what we had to figure out. It was like, we were selling at first, but we were paying $50, $60 for each customer mm-hmm. and we're making $40 a customer. So it was like, that's unsustainable. So we had to keep making video after video after video to test it, test it, test it until it was like, oh, we're paying $3 a customer now. You know what I'm saying? And so then you can scale that. Let's put $300 in, $600 in, and to the point to like, I mean, now we probably spend a million, a million, two every month on just marketing. And, and so like, but we're, we're getting a very healthy ROAS from mm-hmm. that. You know, we're making all of that back and more. And so, um, and we've had videos go viral. Like, I don't know if you know the, um, the TikToker Jimmy darts. Um, mm-hmm. but he's, he's a friend of mine here. He, he, he's from here and now he's off in LA changing the world and doing big things. But, um, he was like, Hey, I'd love to, you know, I, I could take one of your books and, and make a video with it. And, and we we're like, yeah, go do it. And he did it. And it was right after Valentine's day and it went crazy viral and that mm-hmm. spike sales up really high, but you know, viral videos only have a spike. They do, they go up and they go down. So you can't be dependent on viral videos. You have to create video content and marketing content that is scalable with, you know, dollar spend. And so, um, but that really helped us a lot. And then we were on Good Morning America and then we were on QVC and then we were on all these different TV shows and those are good spikes, but they don't sustain us. They were just like little kicks and kick in the pants to, to boost us. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like people focus too much on trying to go viral or trying to get these influencers to do like a one-off thing to take off. It's like, no, you have to find a consistent 
uh, way of pushing your content out, you know, that get people to buy it. Yeah. That's so true too. I think everyone is trying to chase like that viral video and it, you're so right about that. It's like, people remember it for a second and they share it for like what a, a week, maybe at top at most. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of like, you forget about it. The next thing's out there. So when you go back to the first videos that you made, when you finally figured out, like, what was the, the right way to go about it? Like your, your, maybe like your first video that you were like, okay, this is working. Let's be consistent with that. Do you mm-hmm. remember what that video was? Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, we had a guy who was uh, running ads for us at first and he was, he was overcomplicating it. It was too complex. You know, people think, oh, to make money off of a video ad, it needs to be high quality. It needs to be elaborate. There needs to be a storyline. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Like it, it can be five seconds. And so I was looking at this ad that just wasn't working. It wasn't making good ROAS. And I said, hey, just make the caption say best date idea ever. <laughs> that works. It worked <laughs> like crazy, like it five X what we were doing at the time. And that's crazy. Cause I'm like, it literally was just a simple best date idea ever. It's not the best date idea ever, but that it grabs people's attention. And the, and the, and you know, it was the helpless baker. It was the one them baking a pie. And, and oh. we've had lots of video content out there that we've, we've made where it's just, it's just simple. Like I made the video that, you know, got that video in particular, got hundreds of millions of views. I made it on my iPhone and I edited it on iMovie. Like, you know, thing. I didn't use elaborate camera setup. I didn't have, you know, DSLR with bokeh effect in the background and people lapeled up. It was like, I hired two friends. I gave him 50 buck Visa gift cards, said, hey, make a pie together, but he's blindfolded. I'm gonna film you guys. And I just followed him around the kitchen. It took three hours. That video made us three, $4 million. Oh, and so when, when people, Robert Kiyosaki says, don't worry, be crappy. I'm a firm believer in that. I'm like, if you have the resources to up the excellence and up the quality without it really affecting your, your, you know, your consistency, then do it. But at the beginning, you don't need to have a high resolution, perfect frame and cut director ad. Just make it with your iPhone. Just make the, make your message quick. Why should you buy this? How will it help your life? Why will it make your life better? Just quick. And then it converts. (laughs) So most all of your videos then are probably like what, 10 seconds and under, they're not like these commercial no, videos. No, now they're more elaborate. Now we have they, okay. elaborate commercials. We just made a commercial with, um, was it called sleeping at last? Is that the band name? Sleeping at last, the twilight. They, they do. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to this. I don't know. Sleeping at last. I'm, my, my marketing team's going to kill me if they ever hear this, but yeah, <laughs> at last. it was, they, they, they did a lot of the soundtracks for like twilight and a lot of other movies. And we made a short film commercial and uh, we use their music as the background. And um, we probably spent 150 grand on that commercial alone. And- um, but You're we right, just, Sleeping At Last, yeah. Sleeping At Last, perfect, okay, yes. yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, that was, like I said, that, that, that commercial cost us, um, it's called, Are You Ready For An Adventure? It's a little short film. It costs us about 150 grand to make, but we have the capital to play around with that. And right now we're trying to set ourselves up as a household name um, and like we're like, um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be on the Ellen show. And <gasps> That's we, so exciting. I'm stoked about that. Oh um, but we're making all this content now. So when people see us, they do have more brand trust with us because like I said, there are some other competitors out there. So it's like, we have the capital to make hundred thousand dollar commercials. Now let's do it. Let's make our commercials better than everybody else's. And so, um, a lot of our commercials you'll see now are a little bit higher end, but you'll still see some commercials floating around that cost 200 bucks to make. You know, when someone's using a camera or it's a TikTok influencer or something like that, you know. So do you find the best way to go about it now is not doing TV commercials, but kind of putting your commercials on things like Facebook, TikTok, um, YouTube, stuff like that? I know that's like a tricky question for a lot of people. Well, you kind of have to ask yourself who your market is. Like, do you watch TV a lot? Never, never. Exactly. Like who watches TV a lot? (laughs) No one. Netflix and YouTube. That's pretty much it. The only people who watch live TV are typically um, older generation. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and so if you're marketing towards them, TV is great. You know what I'm saying? If you're, if you're, if you're trying to get grandma sitting on the couch, you know, then like, <laughs> awesome. If you're trying to get Gen Zers, they're not watching TV at all. You know, they're all on their phone, even millennials, 90% of millennials. Yeah. So yeah, no, we, we put a lot of ads on like Hulu that that's TV for us, you know, so mm-hmm. we're on Hulu, we're on Amazon prime, we're on these different streaming platforms. Um, and then we also did radio for a little bit, which was fun. Um, in like the cities that listen, like a lot of people are in traffic and listen to radio still. 
But um, as far as like TV, TV, no, we don't do a lot of that. We, we'd like to do a Super Bowl commercial in the next couple of years. Um, but you know, that even that we're talking a couple million dollars spend just for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that would just be more of a, you know, branding idea versus like, it's not like everyone watching the Super Bowl is going to go online and buy our book right then. It's just more of establishing. Uh, but yeah, TV, TV ads are not our, you know, prime source of revenue by any means, you know? Yeah. I, and I wouldn't think so. I would think that mostly, yeah, the social media and getting kind of the word out through there and showcasing what the adventure actually is and like a kind of real way is the best way to go about it. I think a lot of people now, like kind of what you were saying before, a lot of people are kind of craving that like real content, like not too crazy over the top, but it's very realistic for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it goes about kind of like your role now, because I know you have a ton of employees now, but what is your day to day? I would say like, what is your role now? I know you're probably all over the place, but just a typical. Oh no, actually my day to day is simple now. I'm basically hired so i literally <laughs> amazing I, I i resigned as ceo um basically hired my business partner to take over as ceo and i oh there goes my mic one more time there we go um i basically meet with him and a few other leaders in the company once a week and they oh give me God. the overview good lord this mic. is it unplugging here. let's see check 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 one two Check one, two. Better work now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I, I basically meet with them once a week and hear what's going on. And if needed, give some direction. Um, like, hey, looking the- at your dog in the back. Sorry. <laughs> Buddy. He's like jumping up and down. Oh. Like, like, I deserve to be a star. I want to be on the podcast. I know. Oh, okay. So, yes, keep going. You give them some direction within the week. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I, I make the big decisions, you know, like uh, what, which new book are we coming out with? Um, you know, are we going to go with this investor or this investor, things like that, but mm-hmm. no, Ben day runs the business as a CEO. That's it. No, so I mean, one second. Real okay. <laughs> go for it. This is the most interruptions I've had it's on okay. a podcast from him. It's He's totally fine. Quiet. <laughs> Super cute. So it's all good. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So what do you do in your free time then if you're not, when you're not working? Yeah. So right now I'm actually working on a YouTube series. Um, Ooh, and so cool. it's, it's literally, um, I actually spent, uh, the, well, this actually was just released, so it's, it's, it's not going to be news, but I actually spent the first month of this year in rehab. Um, basically like it was, I, it's like weird because I didn't feel like I was an alcoholic, but it definitely was getting to the point where life was getting stressful to where I had to drink every night to kind of get to sleep. And then the stress of running the business and all that kind of stuff would just compile on top. And I was like, I don't want this to be uh, my trajectory. I don't want to keep having to drink to go to sleep. So I went to a rehab for one month. And within that month also kind of realized I want to go after more of my adventurous side, more of like the creative artistic side. And so I was like, I kind of want to spend this year traveling the whole world and I want to learn how to catch a barrel surfing, like how to get tubed, you know? So cool. And I was like, but I also want it to be a journey about sobriety, finding your passion, going after your dreams and kind of all of the shit stew that comes with entrepreneurism. And so basically I'm having, you know, a, a crew of people follow me around the world as I surf these different breaks and actually like get with different trainers, nutritionists, instructors, physicians, and get my body and my talent to a level where I can actually ride barrels. And so we actually just got back from the first location. We were in Oahu for two weeks. Awesome. Dream. Yeah. So that's, I'm actually spending the whole year working on that series. And so um, really not hardly anything entrepreneurial or going after any new business ideas. I'm kind of just taking the year to just kind of do a lot of uh, self-discovery and go after more of that adventurous side to, to bring more life. Well, you busted your ass for how long? So you deserve it. I mean, it's time to do stuff like that, you know? And I feel like, I mean, that's super important too, to kind of like figure out like how your thoughts are when you're by yourself and surfing, I'm sure is like the best way to clear your head, like oh in God, different yeah. places. Water's magical. You know, it's really healing. Yeah. Yeah. So to have that is super important. Is that one of the reasons why you stepped down as CEO? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, well, that yeah. also, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I wasn't, I don't think I was wired to be a CEO. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 
the core of my entrepreneurism is to create financial freedom for myself and to work with rad people and have a fun team. It was not to spend, you know, eight hours a day on logistics and operations and funding and marketing and all of these micro details of building and, and scaling a company. Like that's not fun for me at all. I created the book to help create more of an adventurous lifestyle. And what it did for me is pigeonholed me into a dark, you know, golden handcuffed prison. And I was like, there are people who are like my business partner, Ben Day, he's very wired to be a CEO. He wakes up and comes alive doing that. I do not. So uh, part of the stepping down was because I was like, I enjoyed being the rock star and feeling like, you know, the big man, the face of everything. And but at the end of the day, I was like, yeah, you can be the big man, the face of everything and hate your life. And I'm like, I don't want that. I'd rather have less attention and thrive more in my passion than vice versa. And so that was kind of another big reason for stepping down. When you were in rehab, is that when you kind of like realized that when you were like, I don't want to do this? Well, as far as like, you know, CEO. I, I stepped down before rehab, Okay, but rehab helped really solidify the, I mean, as I stepped down as CEO, but I think there was still a part of me trying to maintain the image of power, which was kind of stupid. Um, but I think rehab really helped establish like, no, like I actually need to let go of adventure challenge even more so I can focus on these other things. I think there's also that fear that you get when something amazing happens in your life. It could be dating, you know, it could be a new job. It could be something like a company taking off. Is it, is this the best thing in my life that's going to happen? And if I don't cling to it, am I going to look back and regret that I didn't cling on harder because it's the best thing mm -hmm. and that keeps a lot of us in dysfunctional relationships. And I had a dysfunctional relationship with my company where it was like, I actually believe that the older I get better and better and better things are going to happen to me. And I actually attract that type of energy as well. And with this company, it, because it was the biggest thing that's happened in my life thus far, it was kind of scary to say like, I'm actually letting go of this. I mean, I let, let it go. I still own the company and I still to an extent run it, mm -hmm. but letting go of like the ident my identity being attached to the creator of it and actually going out and pursuing other things and saying like, I believe my next venture I'm pursuing is going to be twice this big. And then after I let that go, the next thing. And so, uh, yeah. It is hard because I feel like year after year, especially when you're young, you like grow so much. Cause you're, you're like 28. 29 28 yeah I feel like I'm 26 but every year like from 22 to 23 to 24 it's completely changed and I'm like my needs change what I want to do changes my hobbies like everything so it's hard to kind of be attached to something when you're like I'm gonna keep changing and wanting to experience and try different things so it's like when do you kind of break away from that it's it's really a challenging thing and also like do you find that it was hard to have a personal life being so busy like did that kind of hurt you yeah. I mean, it, it consumed my life fully for a while. I mean, but I think, and this is the, this is the balance because right now I think emotional health and mental health is becoming more popular. Uh, but the pendulum swing is starting to go too far to the other side mm -hmm. where it used to be grind, 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 grind. Don't sleep. Don't eat. Don't breathe. Don't do nothing. Grind. And now it's like, no mental health, mental health, mental awareness, self-care. And it's a little too much to the point where it's like, here's the truth. For anything to be crazy successful, and I mean like crazy successful, I'm not talking about making a few extra bucks of passive income. You have to, for a season, obsess over it. There actually is a little bit of an unhealthy relationship that you kind of create with the thing like that because it's not normal. It's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not normal for a company to go from zero to hundred million that fast. It's not normal for, for that type of growth and that many people. It is all consuming. The thing is, is understanding that that has to be temporary and knowing when the cutoff point is. And so like I mentor a lot of entrepreneurs and I'm like, your, might, might not, your life might not have a great balance for a season, but that's okay. As long as you are still taking care of yourself. And one of the ways you got to do that is probably letting go of some substances as well, because that, that's going to be the temptation to numb, to push yourself to get through it. But if you can let go of like some of the substances and incorporate more of a healthy lifestyle, like getting good sleep, eating healthy foods and getting some exercise, those three things, even with an unbalanced life of obsessing over this thing are going to dramatically improve your mental health, also improve your quality of work and improve your lifestyle while you're going about it. But you have to have a time where you go, okay, now let's find that balance of, you know, pursuing my mental health, family time, friend time, alone time, but also time with the company. And so it was tricky to find that balance. But I mean, now 
I have a really healthy balance with work and play. And it's mostly play. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, I was. That was actually what I was going to ask you. Is like I do think that you have to be ultra focused. Like I mean, even looking at athletes, like when they're when they have a meet or a, a game or whatever it is, like for that season that they're in, they have to give it all they got. And it's like balls yeah. to the wall type of thing. And you have to, I mean, there's no way to go around it or else it's like, you're half-assing what you really want to achieve. So mm -hmm. I think that's such a good point, but then it's tricky. Cause it's like, when is the cutoff point? Is it when you get kind of like depressed when you're like burnt out feeling like that's the hard part? Yeah. I mean, and that, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but I do know that it's not for everybody. Like, like high level success is not for everybody. And social media is lying to us. It's telling us that you're not important. You're not significant. You're not special unless you achieve this top 1%. Mm -hmm. It really is for everybody. So there, there's some people who can pursue that and be in that grind for 10, 15, 20 years. You look like Gary V. He does not stop working, but he's so happy. Like he's so happy and he's so like, he just loves, like that makes him come alive versus somebody else who, you know, they work four hours a day in marketing and they feel like they want to slip their wrist. It's like, you gotta, gotta, you really, it, that's why it's so important to know where your passion is, because if you can partner with your passion and obsess over that, you're going to really enjoy the journey versus obsessing over something that you think is going to just give you the most attention and obsessing over that because while you're not getting the attention, you're going to be miserable. And so, you know, you see people pursuing things like acting. And obviously there's a lot of people who have a passion for acting, but you look at the arts and entertainment industry and a large majority of them are pursuing their craft because they don't feel heard, seen, known, loved, discovered, special, whatever. And so they're putting this obsession into this craft like acting and you know five ten years go by and they've booked two commercials and you know a one-liner and they're miserable they're burnt out and they're depressed and they're like well this is what it takes it's like no for me like I pursued acting for a season I came alive in the audition room like when I got an audition that was my big star moment I got to perform in front of five or six judges I got to do my thing I got them laughing whatever I go home feeling like I'm on top of the freaking world whether or whether or not I got the part and it was like, because I just loved it. And I was like, I could have done that for years. But if you can't tap into that type of love with what you're doing, then yeah, you have a very short expiration date on how long you can pursue it. And also, you know, you're just not going to be happy. And so I think it's really important for us to start really figuring out like, what are the things that I could do? And if I never was ultra successful, I would still love the journey of pursuing it. And when we can tap into those things, there's a good chance you could be ultra successful because you have a superpower that a lot of people don't have in that industry. And it's the love for the craft. That's the thing. It's like a lot of it. I mean, everyone says this, but it's like enjoying the process. If you enjoy the process and you love it and it's like you would do it even if you weren't getting paid for it, like that's what you should be doing. And obviously you're not going to be motivated to do it all the time, but as long totally. as you know, that's happening and you're not giving up like relationships along with it. Like Gary V is a good example. Cause he's someone that I would look up to forever. And I would listen to his podcast before I started my business and mm -hmm. he got a divorce recently. So I'm like, okay, well, I mean, maybe there's some stuff going on. You're like, you're giving up your personal life to achieve that. And that's not the right way to go about it either. So yes, I think like finding that balance eventually is important, but you know, it is really tough. I think with anyone, like whatever age you are, it's like, yeah, you know, when's, when's the right time to do those things. So, so now do you have like a certain routine that you do each day that kind of like makes you feel good and makes you feel kind of like alive, I guess I would say. I mean, I mean, my routine looks a lot different and, and this, I, I want to be very clear. Like this is not the routine that I had before um, I achieved financial freedom. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of, a lot of millionaires would go on and be like, you gotta get up early, work out three times a day, read five books a week. And I'm like, no, you don't, you don't have to do any of that kind of stuff like that. It's all helpful. It's adding fuel to your fire. It's not the fire that gets you to where you need to be. I think a lot of millionaires say this whole long process of everything they do every day to make themselves look better and to feel special. Yeah. I'm like, dude, you don't do half of that stuff and you don't need to do half that stuff. So, but now because I value my mental health and my physical health and my coming alive, I have a very um, more rigid, intense schedule to where I'm going to bed at eight. I'm up with the sun. I'm down with the sun. Nice. Um, I'm working out every day. I'm doing Wim Hof breathing exercises. I'm submerging myself in an ice bath every day. And I'm, I'm going to counseling. I'm doing therapy and all of these things. It's like, I really enjoy doing because I feel myself coming more alive, being more present, being healthier. Um, and it's just like, yeah, I like doing that now for my, for my mental health. And also when you become financially successful, you lose the need, you lose the, um, a lot of pain 
leaves your life because you actually have more opportunity to avoid pain because you can hire people to do the things that you don't want to do. And that takes away a lot of the discomfort and inconvenience in life. And so as bougie and as stupid as it sounds, I'm having to seek discomfort in order to continue to grow because otherwise you'll kind of just plateau. You're used to everyone taking care of everything for you. You're not used to pushing yourself past your mental break and you're not stretching and, and building yourself up. And so uh, right now I'm doing a lot to stimulate growth and, and challenge hardship, um, stress and things like that to, to grow. Yeah. Because I mean, you're still super young. There's so much more life to live. And I know there's like always going to be things that come up and this is like your original baby for sure. Um, but do you see yourself ever like starting another business or do you think this will always kind of be your baby and you're just going to focus? I mean, obviously it's hard to tell right now. I know that, but focusing on hobbies more and kind of what your passions are outside of work and this will be your baby. Or do you find that eventually you'll want to start another business? Yeah. I mean, I think you know, any business that I start now is going to come from a place of fun and something I want to build for the fun of it versus like, let's make more millions, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, a hundred percent more companies I will create. And I think a lot of the companies I create will come out of like content production will come out more of, cause I'm, I have a real big passion for people going after their dreams, but doing it in a way that's healthy. And so I think that there's a lot of things I'm going to be creating that will turn into a company, but, um, but yeah, we'll see. Like, the, I definitely believe that I'll have other companies in the future. Um, it's just not going to look the same as this one that I just built it, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, everything is always going to be a little bit different once you, you know, you grow and you have your new experiences and the knowledge that you have behind you. So, all right. So where's next on your, your surfing trip with this YouTube series? I want to hear a little bit more about that. What are some of the places that you're going to be going soon? I mean, anywhere where there's a good surf break, I'm going, I'm literally traveling the whole world shut of it, short of it. Uh, going to shit or world war four, you know, so world of three, like I'm literally trying to, um, uh, so I'm uh, next month I'm going to the UK, London. People are like, there's no surf in London. Yeah, there is. There's a man-made surf ranch, um, there. That's like this, basically this man-made lake that creates these perfect waves. And so I've booked 25, one hour sessions there in a week. So oh it's God. like a lot of vigorous training. And then right after that, we're going to Mexico, um, and we're going to be, you know, stepping off of jet skis onto our boards, trying to get into tubes. And then we're going to the Maldives and we're going to Bali and then we're going to Brazil. So we're, we're going literally all over the world where the waves are. Um, and then we're going to some places where there's some really cool, like holistic medical practices and okay. experimenting with different things like that. And, but oh, then we're going to Alaska in May. We're going to surf, you know, freezing cold water with like snow mountains in the background. Uh, taking seaplanes, like we're going to, you know, those planes that like launch off the water, they're going to like land right behind the surf break. We jump out of the plane into the water. What surf, the heck? And get back in the plane and fly back. So like some really fun adventures. Um, I'm really excited to show some of these on like social media and YouTube and stuff. It'll you got to be- have a GoPro strapped to your head or something when you we're do having, that. We're having a whole camera crew follow me. So that sounds amazing. Uh, we have GoPros and DSLRs and sport cameras and yeah, we're, we're documenting the whole thing. So we'll are you it- staying in Airbnbs? When I think of this, I'm thinking of like, you're camping on the beach, you're waking up and you're getting in the water. <laughs> Yeah, some of it will be. Yeah, is some it going to be kind of like that? All right. I think it's a it's going to be a mixture between glamping and camping. Okay. Like, there's definitely places like the Maldives. There's nothing camping about that. We're staying in a nice Those resort. Are like the huts and the is it yeah. like the ones in the water? Those yeah. look so freaking cool. Yeah, no, that's going to be luxurious. Um, but then there's places like Mexico. It's like, yeah, we'll be on the beach and be waking up with the sun. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be a mixture. Like uh, Alaska will be a little bit more roughing it in the woods, I think. But, you know, going to like Bali and stuff now, we'll be staying in nice places. <laughs> you got to treat yourself a little bit. Are you, um, is it, there's a certain timeline. It's just going to be one year exactly, or you don't have a specific timeline. Yeah. Before the end of this year, I have to get tubed. So okay. yeah, before the end of this year, which I, I think is very doable. Um, so yeah, I think it's doable. When is the first episode going to be out or is it already up? No. Um, well, there'll be some pre episodes like promos and trailers and things like that coming out soon. I don't know when the first episode is going to come out. Cause I'm not sure how many destinations we need to travel to before we release the first episode. Okay. I'm still trying to play with, um, how long each one is. And then we're still playing with the idea of it being a documentary from like beginning to end. So we're still playing with a couple of those ideas, but mm-hmm. we'll start posting content to YouTube pretty quick. And the YouTube channel right now is just the fail journal YouTube channel. Um, and we're going to start creating content and posting it up there pretty soon. 
but also just my social media on Instagram page. I'll be posting a lot of the stuff for people. My God, I'm really excited. I'm going to watch all of it. That sounds amazing. Can't wait to see it. All right. Well, where can they find you? I know the, um, your YouTube channel, but where can they find your, your website, your social media, all that stuff. Yeah. So social media is Bryant S Ellis. I'm mostly active on Instagram. I just started TikToking like two days ago. Oh, you're becoming I was like, a TikToker right. now. Yeah, I'm like, all right, I hate TikTok, but I'm going to start posting videos of stuff I like to talk about and whatever. Uh, but then, yeah, The Fail Journal is my podcast. I um, haven't released an episode in a while because I've been busy, but um, and then they can find me on YouTube also, The Fail Journal. And then any of the books that they want to look at, my adventure books, it's just theadventurechallenge.com. And where are they sold? Which stores? Um, e-commerce. Okay. It's all fine. So awesome. all online, you can buy it on Amazon, you can buy it on our personal website. You can buy it on a lot. We're going to be in retail this year though. There's going to actually you like, are. I think like seven, 800 different stores will be in retail. That's um, so freaking cool. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be in retail this year. Um, I think we're already in Kohl's and a few other ones, but yeah, this year we're having a massive retail rollout. So awesome. Well, I'm excited to see the journey and thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. All right.